Hey everyone, welcome to Beers and Brandy. So, right. so, we're doing it a little bit different tonight. Last time, we used the whole room, we had a big sound system, and it still was like crazy hard to hear. So tonight, we're gonna bring it down a little bit. We're gonna, we're gonna project as well as we can. Um, but if you guys can't hear something, let us know, okay? We'll speak up to you, okay? My name is Kyle Golding, I'm your host tonight. This is Tabby Burwell. From the Oklahoma City Convention of Visitors Bureau. There we go. And PR Professional the current, the current of the Year. PR Professional of the Year designated by PRSA. Very good. On my right here is Pritch Pritchard, the University of Oklahoma PR professor. Boomer Center. And career PR professional. Pritch's specialty is crisis management. My specialty is communication integration. And Tabby's specialty is traditional PR and media relations. Pritch, give everyone just a couple of minutes of your general uh, concept of public relations today, thanks to the invent of the internet and other new digital tools. It's harder. It's a lot harder than it was back in the day. Um, and I'm an old fart, so I can say that. Um, we, uh, we don't have the same amount of time that we did. You had a news cycle then, you could tell if something happened, you could, you had time to prepare your response to make sure all the pieces were in place. And today that news cycle is as short as a second. Uh, it really is challenging. I, I will tell you, I'm glad I did what I did when I did it, because I don't know that I could keep up. Well, if I was younger, I could probably keep up with it. But the other side of that is, that this is a, a, a much more robust and potentially engaging environment than we've ever found ourselves in. The intent of social media, by the way, still not being ful completely fulfilled by a lot of people, but the intent was on the PR side to be able to have an engagement with the audience. And yet so many folks today are using it as a trumpet, a loudspeaker, whatever, as one-way communication, I'm going to blast stuff out. The best use of social media and the thing that we need to embrace and do better at is that engagement piece, talking back to the audience, talking not back to, sorry, but with the audiences that have chosen to engage with our with our brand. So there's good news, bad news from my perspective. Because that should be a two-way conversation for, yeah, absolutely. for everyone, right? Absolutely. Tabby, your same question. I see it differently. I think it's easier. Um, I did start PR when we had to fax a press release, so I'm a little bit old. Um, but I feel like I can um, really utilize influencers to talk about my brand. I can utilize social media. There's a lot of free tools that I can utilize that I didn't have in the past. Um, usually in the past, I used to be one voice talking about um, my history as I used to work for the Ford Center and the Cox Convention Center. So I was one person talking about a concert that was happening in Oklahoma City. Now I can bring uh, like influencers in and bloggers in and I have multiple voices talking about that same thing. So I see it a little bit different from a digital perspective of um, I can really utilize other people to be talking about the same thing in the same uh, mannerism, but for free. Um, and I don't have to pay, I mean, I don't have to pay anything for that. So I see it from Pritch's perspective, but I also see from a younger perspective of, we kind of grew up in the age of technology. Um, we, we grew up in the age of, it wasn't just one press release or just getting on the, on the four o'clock or five o'clock news. We want to hit all the outlets. Um, we want to use all of our, our mediums to reach those outlets. And so I, I see it a little bit differently. And I'm, I'm going to be a contrarian and push back at you a little bit. Because that's what we do here. I, we chop I, it up. I think, you're, I think you're absolutely right. There are more tools. You can do more stuff. It doesn't cost you as much. You can get more people talking about your brand. And that's good if it's good. If. Exactly. If, if you do it that good. way. If it's not good, holy crow. It's absolutely right. If you can do it that way. Yeah. But lots of people are taking the shortcut of just trying to sell something, you know. And that's that's that that one way conversation you were yep. discussing earlier. Deleted. On our podcast recently, we talked about the fact that I did a presentation five years ago. I'm gonna pat myself on the back, I was really smart. All 
real trendy marketing at that time, which is mainstream marketing now, was actually at its core just public relations. Influencer marketing, content-based marketing, push-pull, inbound marketing, all kinds of things that really aggressive, trendy marketers are doing right now is at its core public relations. It's telling a story, honestly and truthfully, giving more detail and information than you would get out of, out of an advertisement without that direct call to action, without that buy, purchase, go here that you get with, with advertising. That's what PR is, but that's what social media is these days. That's what content-based marketing is. When you're telling your story in multiple ways completely, a whole lot longer and deeper than you would in advertising, that's content-based marketing. Influencer marketing, same thing. In PR, you would get your client on TV or on the radio or quoted in a newspaper magazine. They were the influencer and people would say, oh, that, that CEO, I should do business with them. That CEO is very smart. Nowadays, influencer marketing, we're taking smart people who are connected and having them say nice things about our product, service, or company, and other people are going, oh, I should do business with them. I should make this purchase. So uh, current marketing, especially digital marketing, at its core is public relations. So that's why it's important for all of us as communicators to understand where it comes from so we can understand how to best use it the way Pritch was describing. Data point. You all are aware of the Edelman Trust Barometer, right? No? Every year, Edelman, the largest publicly, uh, uh, the largest private public relations firm in the world, does a worldwide, wide, I can't talk tonight, more <laughs> beer, does a worldwide survey of business leaders and people, and for the past decade, the most trusted source of information is somebody just like you and me which ups the ante, in my opinion, right. the social media and that relationship stuff that has been so essential to public relations over the, over the years. And why I think Kyle is right on when he says that it's really public relations, it's really relationships that we should be focusing on. Hope I didn't hijack No, you. no, no, that's perfect. That's a perfect point. Uh, so I'll take us to our next point, which is a two-way conversation. As communicators, especially marketing people, and I, I, I pick on marketing people in these things sometimes, but I'm a marketing guy too, so I'm, I'm part of the problem. Marketing, especially advertising people, like they want to shout that message. Advertising is just standing on a street corner shouting, buy my beer. <laughs> marketing is the work behind advertising so that you find the right audience, the right message, and the right combination. Of course, public relations is a completely different approach to communicating information. So. In a digital age where people are just shouting, buy our beer, uh, Tabby, what's the importance of not just doing that, but doing that long game work of public relations? I'll put it in perspective of what I do in an everyday. Um, so I promote Oklahoma City and why somebody would want to come here for tourism. Why would somebody want to be a visitor to Oklahoma City? Um, and so we have a lot of people, locals, who buy into what we're, we're doing every single day. And we really rally that and we understand that the locals live here. They understand what, what makes Oklahoma City great. So we really utilize those people to tell our story and to be those advocates for Oklahoma City. So you have the people who are yelling like, Oklahoma City is great, but then you have us telling the story of Oklahoma City. Where did we start? Uh, how did we get where we're at today? What did maps do for Oklahoma City? The PR standpoint that I pull in is I'm able to talk about in 1993, we, we passed a one cent sales tax that really revitalized our whole entire city. So then it's become a more of a story of why our locals fell in love with Oklahoma City, um, why they're rallying behind it because they've seen it, they've seen Bricktown, an area where you wouldn't go at nighttime to a place where all of our visitors go. Um, so I think the, the PR aspect of it is is taking that what was the real part of that story and 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 pulling all those elements together to make it the bigger piece it's not the yelling out that oklahoma city's great we have this and we have that and we have rapids and all of those cool things that other people don't have it's the how did we get here today what made us who we are um, and really telling that story whether it is from a press release and an influencer and all of those local advocates that we do have let me ask all of you would you be more influenced to visit a city for tourism 
uh, because you saw an, an official ad from their CVB in a, in a magazine or saw a commercial on TV. You know, we see commercials all the time for right? Dallas or Missouri and like they all have these commercials. Are you more influenced as an individual by those, by a TV commercial or if someone that you appreciate their opinion or someone you know or like online, so your social media friends, if they're all like, man, I just went to this vacation in Nashville and it's awesome. Right. What's more influential? Yeah. Right, word, word of mouth, which is the, the highest trust point, right? Absolutely, the trust point. And so, especially true for millennials. Lots and lots of research, they do more and more things on the basis of recommendations from their friends. Again, amplifying that trust barometer finding over the past decade. So, if you can build trust and influence people to do something like visit Oklahoma City or buy some Anthem beer right. um, without shouting, buy this beer, drive drive here, but influencing people and using uh, social media right. constructs, uh, or public relations constructs online, that's what you would do, right? Storytelling, right? Yeah, it's storytelling. Storytelling. And, our, and once you get locals to buy into what what you're promoting, you really rally that. And you, you get those people, you pull them in and say, be a part of the club, help us tell that story. Um, you, you make them your brand ambassadors. And so that's what we've really, really, really relied on. Our city loves our city. I mean. <laughs> she actually kind of halfway answered okay. the question. But it was, it was if, you know, if you got, if you're trying to get people to come visit, where, where does it, and they're, they're trusting the, uh, one of their friends on their experience that they had. Where's the work that you do that traces it all the way back to that ultimate experience, or that ultimate end user experience? Is it starting with the locals? And I think that's what you just said. Let's find them the Cre stories, I think. Creating an experience for the locals, yeah. so then they're telling their friends and their friends. Yeah. It's, a, it's a mix yeah. of your influencers, your locals, uh, you you still are doing your paid placement advertising. You're still doing the, the big picture stuff, uh, but mixing in the local stuff, the influencers, uh, and then sort of really long play around the way stories, uh, telling the how the rapids were, were made, like the construction aspect. Getting that published in a construction magazine, you wouldn't think is right. tourism, right. but. There are going to be plenty of folks who read construction magazines and go, man, I've got to go see this. Yeah. Or they think Oklahoma City has a white rap water rapids facility. That We get that a lot. Um, but we're always pulling into those kind of places. I'm sure there are publications about beer and, and brewing. Right. Uh, and so if we could spotlight where the breweries, when they open a tap room, or if they do something that's unique or different, um, if the locals are talking about it and the CVB can maybe pick and push it in certain directions, then someone goes, oh, well, we love beer, let's go to Oklahoma City, right? Well, the, the other thing to consider too is everybody likes that inside story. Everybody loves to be in the know. So the behind the scenes stuff is really becoming very, very effective uh, in addition to that, that friend uh, imprimatur, if you will. So we're, we're seeing that being used an awful lot. I have a question okay. based on what you were saying. So we do a lot of storytelling with our parents Certainly. Um, because they're going to be the one that usually gets the buy-in of what our story is for their for, for child. So have you ever been in a situation where you've had to change that where you are maybe uh, your target is an older teen where they're going to influence the decision yep. for the parents? Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Um, and what's your best way of keeping up with the times? As in, what's the most popular way if you needed to change that target? How would you know? I'll piggyback off your question and ask Pritch specifically. At OU, attracting students, you have to attract the student and the parents have to sign off oh, yeah. on it, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. So you have multiple audiences? Yeah. What, what's the approach here to how you uh, influence both sides of that conversation? I feel like that's our hardest part, right. is we have a broad range. Target, what we want to talk about. Right. But sometimes it is that split. Well, I, I do think it's absolutely essential to bifurcate your target stakeholders to the greatest extent possible. Um, the you don't have to run one campaign. No, you don't. You can run multiple. You don't. All absolutely. The so there could be a campaign for parents who are influencers of their children. 
could be older teens, it could be alums of the of Girl Scouts to help influence. I mean, and, and every one of those messages may be the same, but every one of those messages may, may be different. The number one thing parents wants to know, want to know when they come into Gaylord Hall is, is my child going to get a job at the end of this? And is my money going to be well spent? And my dean's line is, I, he always ends up in our agency uh, with 3,000 square feet of purpose-built space. It's amazing. You should come see it. It is cool. We have a brag board with 96 of our recent alums and where they are in the world. And he always stops there and says, if you come here, if you apply yourself, if you get involved, you pay attention to these people, point to the faculty, he says, I like your chances. And, and that's what parents want, us, but it's that brag board. And that's the message that we're trying to send to those particular parents. The kids want to know, I'm sorry, young professionals want to know, what are they going to be able to get involved with? Can I get my hands on something? Is it just going to be sitting in class, or am I actually going to be able to create some portfolio pieces and so that message is very different and we and we walk them through there again the agency is a perfect example to show them what the work of the students and how they can be involved and so so it really is important i think to understand all of your target stakeholders and then match the message pain points behavior beliefs motivations to each one of those separate groups so that you can match your and then message. Adapt all of that per channel. Yep. Snapchat is different than Instagram. It's different than Twitter. It's different than Facebook. Yep. Right. Your question was how, how do you stay ahead? You read a lot. <laughs> and I'm lucky I have them in the classroom. <laughs> I used to work at a university at UCO before I went to the CBB. And my job was to get, recruit students to live on campus. So I had the same problem or situation of I had to convince parents that it was a safe facility or why would they pay that money for their student to live on campus and go to school. So it's not only are they paying for the college, they're also paying to live on campus. So we had to have those talking points of why does a parent want a student to live on campus because they're making the decision. They're the ones paying the money. They're the ones, they have different talking points definitely like you said than the students are going to have. Just like uh, a young girl joining a Girl Scouts to a teen getting involved to a parent wanting them involved. Um, so I think just having the talking points um, and those sellers are going to change it for you and, and having the right mediums to reach them. And the students want to know, I, they, sometimes they care it's safe, but are they going to have a good time? Yeah, they, they want to know like what are the hours that it closes, does pizza deliver here, you, you know. Yeah. Right. Where this all falls apart is not adapting per channel. Yeah. Right. So if you write one campaign that's trying to cover everyone, first of all, everyone's not your client. When you try to cover everyone, you convince no one. So you have to be specific. You can do multiple campaigns addressed at your different stakeholders, but each channel has to have its own structure, uh, its own starting point and ending point, its measurements, the way it's built. Uh, you know, Snapchat, you know, you got 10, 15 seconds, got to get in and get out, you know it's kids. Uh, there are adults there, but you know who your audience is. Instagram is a little bit more middle of the road. You can get a lot more parents on Twitter, Facebook, email, video, you know, platforms. Uh, and great things about some things like email and Facebook, because college students aren't looking at the same things their parents are on Facebook and definitely not subscribe to the same emails, is you can give a very different, right. you can right. give a very if different message. The right. yeah. um, but it's the same thing for businesses. So like businesses want to attract as many types of people to their tap room or to a restaurant or to the, a car lot, right? Well, they may want to attract people who really like or spend a lot of money. And they're going to hit them with, we got the high-end brand here. That's one email list. But they want to hit the economy shopper, the value shopper. That's a different email list with a different offer. And, and they collect those emails in a different way so that you already know predisposition, yeah. what your audience is looking for, and you give them that. The great thing is you're literally telling this audience you're a great value car lot, and you're telling this audience you have high-end cars that you can come spend a lot of money on at the same time and neither one knows you're telling the other one that so you don't pollute either message so that's the power of digital tools versus 
back in the day where yeah. there were three TV stations, one newspaper, and two radio stations. Because everyone got the same message over and over. To your point, I just took uh, a number of students up to Chicago to visit PR agencies. We saw the bigs, we saw the mediums, and the, we saw the small seven of them in two days. And personalization was the name of the game at every stop along the way to riff off of what you yep. were saying. And the tools allow you to do that to the extent I wouldn't have believed when I was in the business. So I, th I think in addition, and, and that comes down to understanding who your target stakeholders are to a fairly well. You can't understand them if you don't collect data. Yep. How many of you are actively collecting data on a regular basis of who your customer is and what their habits are? I'd love to ask about surveying. Right? <laughs> Yes. Answer on their so. Huge value in listening to the voice of your audience. Even more so, five times more when there are girls in your program already, what they like and dislike, because it's a whole lot easier to keep them than to get yeah. them the first time. And that goes for clients of business as well, right? It's e the first time through the door is a hard part. The second time is a little bit easier, and the third time, you're right on track. What are your thoughts on data collection and, and data use in general? So we just did a big research campaign about people coming to Oklahoma City and what their perception of us were. Um, and that led us to believe like people didn't know what the Boathouse District was. Uh, they didn't know um, about maps. They didn't know all these things. So we can now use this data and put that into our ads, into our press releases, into our everyday content that we're putting out there. So we are educating um, and, and putting that in front of them, but in a fun way so they want to read it. Um, so I think it's very vital to collect that data, to know who your audience is. Um, but like for us, we segment our audiences. I mean, you have some people who are interested in just paddle sports. You have some people who are interested in girls getaways. Um, we really have to zero, like dial in to the, that audience and talk to them um, because they're only going to listen and they have a short time span of what they're listening to because we know that's the only thing they're really interested in. They're only interested in a uh, weekend getaway. That's all they want to know about. They're not interested in anything else. So we have to talk to that audience. And attention spans are getting shorter yeah. and shorter and shorter. Yeah. We've done a lot of video because blog content isn't relevant anymore. They're not staying on our blog. So once we do quick videos, we notice they're they're viewing this and they're staying on a lot longer um, because I mean, we, we take that data, we can tell, we can see what our Google Analytics are. We can I'm, gonna, I'm gonna emphasize what you just said. Broad approach, yeah. broad is, is, isn't effective. No. Yeah. Stop trying to get everyone on the damn planet to be excited about that thing you do. <laughs> it's a waste of time and money and effort. Like, Coca-Cola doesn't have everyone. Nike doesn't have everyone. Apple doesn't have everyone. The first mistake in anyone who's my one of my potential clients is, I want everyone to love us. What a huge waste of time and money. Right, it's unrealistic, it's a, it's a huge undertaking, and then if you spent the kind of money for everyone to even be aware of you, much less like you, the cost return is ridiculous. You know, you'd have to run, you'd have to buy every Super Bowl ad, not one, but all of the Super Bowl ads for everyone to be talking about you enough. And they better be good. And then some people are still gonna go, well, they're, they're dumb, like, what, what is that? Kit, at the Better Business Bureau, you have access to a lot of information, a lot of data. How much are you harnessing that to, to adapt your communications? You use the data in reverse almost, but you, again, you use what you knew about your clients to inform your decision making. That's the main thing is, your decision making should come from a data informed place. Because if you guess, yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Yes. Like while I work where I work, and to start applying surveys and results and ROI, you're like, what the hell? <laughs> what the hell, Girl Scouts? <laughs> Go eat your cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Yeah. yeah. So why not do it this year? Right? Yeah. <laughs> my my I, question would be, um, you guys were talking about, you know, for the rich people, you're going you're gonna to talk about those really high-end funds. You know, the, the opposite. But for us, it's really hard to identify uh, really the only way that we know is where, where they live. And sometimes that's not even a good indicator. Or, uh, or their age level. So we have, you know, like the brownies and the juniors, but we don't really know who's in those rooms as right. far as what's their income like or right. what things are they interested in. So other than the social media aspect of it, from, okay, yeah, we're going to target younger girls, so we're going to send out this Snapchat folks, or we're going to target the moms to Facebook and email. What are some other ways that we can identify, you know what I mean? I have great information for you. Okay. <laughs> um, I help the Boy Scouts figure this out. Okay, great. Um, because there's a, there's a type of profile to a parent who appreciates the Boy Scout and a type of profile of a parent who would probably say the Boy Scouts are very outdated, not something I want my kids. There are lots of things and everyone wants to go straight to education level, economic factors, zip code, right? That's the easy stuff. You can call any data place and go, ah, I'm gonna, a mailing list. Right. Household income, zip code. Okay, you have to go much deeper than that. But if you go much deeper, you'll be able to build these separate lists. So the thing about the Boy Scouts was um, literally not political affiliation had a lot to do with it. And subscriptions to magazines, outdoor magazines, hunting magazines, gun magazines, sailing magazines. If the mom and dad were interested in that, uh, even Sports Illustrated. Um, so there were certain magazine subscriptions that can inform that. Certain uh, leisure activities. Uh, is, so if mom and dad are members of uh, the Sierra Club or an outdoor group or a, a, a hiking club, then they probably encourage that for their kids. Um, purchases of like kayaks and tents and travel trailers. It, it informs you that the, that the parents are outdoors types, that they're venture types. And those type of people, because of data we already knew from the Boy Scout parents, were the type of people that say, I want my kids outside, I want them doing activities, I want them to be good at these things. And the Boy Scouts was the scenario for them. So I think it would be very similar for the Girl Scouts. And, and we have the means to make it happen. Sure. Yeah. Sure. That's part so, of it as well, right? That's a good question, but I'm fairly new to the industry. So, yeah, I was going to say, how do you find that, how do you gather that data other than surveys? I'm, I'm not, I'm not from the technical writing industry, so I'm not. You could buy that data. Go to the go to the local library and see if they have a, a subscription to MRI Plus. Okay. MRI is a great tool the advertisers have been using forever. I, I bet one of your board members or I stakeholders bet, has, bet, has a, a absolutely. Uh, but that'll give you that'll give you the a wealth of data. I'm willing to bet the Girl Scouts National Office oh, has sure. some of that data. I'm sure. Uh, you can buy some of these things, and then you can reach out to some of your stakeholders. I'm assuming, again, you have people on your board that run corporations, and they have access to data like this that you can crunch these things down. Kit? Collaboration is always a good idea in an experiential marketing where you have events or you do things and you and you bring multiple peoples into a space together or get people out of their normal spaces into a new space. Uh, those are ways to break barriers down where you can get people in a room together and either connect them or learn from them. So that's, these are things you can do. Obviously, you recruit in a, in a way. If you take Kit's idea and go recruit, like, once a year you should do a recruitment activity that you've never done before, 180 degrees from your normal recruiting. It might fail miserably, but even that failure will inform you as to what is and isn't available to you. And if you do that, eventually you're gonna find something that latches on you didn't expect, and you have a new avenue. And all of the failures along the way will still push you in certain directions, if you look at the data. So like your event with Metro Family, that is something that's kind of out of the box, that they have a whole whole group of audience or database that you guys didn't touch into before. Um, so I see that working really well for you. And There's a lot of data on the back end of the social media tools today that you can get for absolutely nothing. 
and tools that will help you get there that are free as well. So, I mean, we should be swimming in data. The key is to create an attitude about data collection uh, and usage and start. You know, the best time to start is 20 years ago, the second best time is today. <laughs> so, right. Uh, so, uh, this is a great example here. You're doing something outside of a normal marketing process that might bring some new ideas to you. Just that simple idea of opening yourself up to the process is already going to make you better at what you do, not because we're phenomenal, even though these guys really are phenomenal, but because you're just changing your mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. I'm going to rephrase it in case anyone didn't hear it. But uh, Kit was inspired by a conference that wasn't what she does. But the idea of, of changing it up was was inspirational to her. So, what are some what are some ways you you find ideas you steal from people that are outside of convention and visitors? A lot of times, I look at influencers in the in the space of the internet and see what are they what are they doing. So it might not have to be that they're a travel writer. Um, they might be doing something on food. But I'm like, well, that's an interest to me because I also want to attract people who like food who come to my city. Um, so a lot of times I kind of troll the internet, <laughs> um, to be frank, and, and see what other people are interested in. Who do they follow um, and gain interest in the, in the types of um, group pages on Facebook or the um, other influencers on Instagram that they're following and kind of leads me to that. So it's kind of along the same ways, but that's the type of people I follow and then I get kind of tuned into who their audience is, what they're interested in, and think, they might be a whole different audience that I never considered. One really good example is we only focused on travel writers up until last year. It was the only people we used to bring in. And then one day it clicked to me. I'm like, there's a whole group of lifestyle bloggers that talk about makeup or they talk about their kids or whatever it is, but they have millions of followers. And why am I not tapping into that audience? And so I took a trip to Dallas. I sat down and met with nine bloggers in two days and I brought them all to Oklahoma City and they've tapped into a whole different audience that I never thought before. So it's a whole different perspective that I had never, like it hadn't crossed my mind that they're an audience. Um, they're just, they have people looking at them but in different ways and they might be like, oh my gosh, I get food tips from them or baby tips from them but now I'm getting trip ideas from them and it was just a cool new concept that I tapped into this year. Yeah. It's a huge block of influence, mom, mommy bloggers, mommy for sure. Bloggers. It's like a, a main route that it's easier to bring people in to experience it that aren't already here to see it or hear about it. If we're, we're tapping into anything, I think if we bring these people here to talk about it, they're also ambassadors. Right. So we get these people here that may have thought like, why would I go to Tokoma City if I live in Dallas? We have everything in Dallas. And then we open their, their eyes to, you don't have the National Memorial Museum. Right. You don't have a Rapids facility. You don't have all this. And it's three hours away. Um, so that's why I tap into those people because we have these local influencers. But they're, and, and, and on, honestly, there's some people here locally that don't even know what we have. And that's, <laughs> yeah. that's true. Um, yeah. But convincing the people that are, we know our drive market is, is 300 miles out. That's a big market yeah. for us. So Joplin, so Amarillo. Is a pretty big part of it. I mean, people in right and we have and then taking it out and kind of spread it yeah and then they create content for us that we can use if it's evergreen we can use it over and over they create social media content they create followers behind it those people start to become our followers they engage with our newsletter whatever it is so I'm more likely to work with content creators that are not necessarily specifically like travel writers or mommy bloggers, but people that create really exciting, interesting content that other people are paying attention to online. Uh, I will engage them to do a project for me because the content they create is going to be good for my client, but then the backside stuff and all the attention they draw is more important. So they could be a lifestyle photographer, but I would say, Tabby, you need to bring them in for, tur for tourism because the content they create is so exciting and it attracts attention. Right. So, like, I just brought in an interior decorator blogger from Tulsa. She would have never been on my radar, um, but I kind of looked at her content and thought, how can we make 21C align with contemporary design and the art and all of the culture experiences that she kind of hits on? 
um, because I saw she had such a big audience. So we made, we we drove that content. We figured out that that map of what that would look like, and she came here, experienced all those things, and then developed developed a way to to attract her readers in a way that. Like, oh, I wouldn't have thought of it that way. Like, I wouldn't have thought Oklahoma City would have such a, a cultural experience or a design experience. Um, so it was tapping into somebody I would have never looked at before. Created a new avenue. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, I mean, this is probably far offhand, but as Oklahoma City, the economy has been growing, you know, the last five or ten years, what fraction of that has been local versus people coming in here because they're aware of the growth and you know the new things going on well we have a chamber that attracts people to live here right. um, so we're constantly going after those Millennials and those people to bring in their businesses because right. we're an affordable city right. um, it's really hard to track who like is it locals talking about our city that are bringing people here is it us talking about something and landing in the New York Times right. except you know when you stop doing it it stops right so you have to do it but, but the percentages are hard notice the momentum like like I'm not gonna lie like I feel like I kill it at media relations because my goals I'm I went 277 percent over my goal this year in media relations in yeah. making those pitches every chance I could. We got in Vogue. That's a spot you would have never saw of Oklahoma City. Um, right. Right. But I'm trying to think of avenues of every which way. Like I'm, I'm making sure we're pitching all these spots saying, why are you not talking about our, our brand or our company or our city? We have a goal every month of how much pitches we want. Um, so I tracked how many assists I take. So how many people call me and say, I want to come to Oklahoma City or I need information about Oklahoma City so I can write about it. And then we track how many pitches um, and we developed that, we, we delivered that to our board in a way that how much exposure did we get in, in a given month and then in a given year, and what was that percentage over. Um, so it, we've never been under, so I can't say like, what did we fill at? It's always been, how much over did we achieve in our overall ex ex exposure? Rich, how do you steal ideas outside of university and what Lindsay and Asp is doing and adapt them to what you do with, with your students. Well, I'd, I'd be remiss as a newly elected board member if I didn't mention the Public Relations Society of America as a prime resource. I, honestly, I've been involved since 88 and the offerings that PRSA has today are better than I've ever seen them before. So. The teleconferences, the new certificates, that. and that sort of thing. I've also been involved in the Public Relations Student Society of America for the last 16 years. And I will tell you, those students are inspirational. So uh, if I'm having a bad day, I just go to the schoolhouse. Can't have a bad day. It's kind of easy to come up, up with out-of-the-box ideas when you're working Absolutely. with young people, right? The, the secret sauce, though, for me are the newsletters. Uh, PR Week, Ad Week, Ad Age, PR Daily, Bulldog Reporter, I mean, uh, and about a bazillion others that I never knew I even wanted to look at. But uh, seeing that stuff come over the transom every day uh, really does engage me in, in terms of new ideas. So I highly encourage read, read, read. Not a bad idea, right? Right. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think a good answer to the, the original question of like uh, taking something that's not intended for your audience and making it yours, um, I think this is a great example of that. Um, we got all of you outside of a traditional marketing talk. You know, we're not in a in a grand ballroom, we're not on a stage, it's not suit and tie, we're not uptight, we don't have a PowerPoint going, <laughs> we don't have rubber chicken for lunch, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> we, uh, we, we sort of took a little bit, we stole a little bit of Gary Vee, Gary Vanderchuk, and I, I know you guys know him, and if you don't, for the love of God, go follow Gary Vee on, online. Uh, we stole a little bit of him, uh, a little bit of a traditional marketing talk, um, a little bit of a just a kind of chop it up session, you know, uh, bullshit and beer kind of session, <laughs> and uh, landed on this format that we still kind of keep adapting for our audience to keep trying to make it better and more interesting and answering more of your questions. That too. How many times have you been to a conference where the person stands up there and talks for an hour, hour and a half? 
with a full presentation and then they walk off the stage and you're sitting there going, how do I use that? Well, you come to something like this where our goal is to not talk at you for an hour and a half, but answer your question as to how you use that. Van, everyone's asking a question, but you. Do you have a question? Oh, no. If you don't, it's not, it's okay if you don't. Top three things for crisis management. Understand the problem, understand the organization, understand the stakeholders. Just off the top of my head, the first thing I always wanted to make sure I knew was what the heck was going on. Because the first reports are always wrong. The worse the first report is, the worse the problem is, and the more wrong that information is. Yep. So get my arms around the problem was number one. Understanding the players at the table, who was, who was going to be aggressive, who was going to be conservative, who was going to listen, who was going to go, ah, we don't need your help, was number two. And then number three was understanding who we needed to talk to. And I will tell you, number one on that list should always be employees. Right. Because they're talking over the fence. They've been doing it life ad nauseum, right? And if, and if they find out about something from the press report or the social media, you're in big trouble. Or if they say something as an employee, oh, yeah. they'll be taken as the brand voice as even the when they're not voice. authorized. Yeah. So you have to keep them under control. Yeah. So yeah. that's my top three. Any tips on crisis management? I was just going to say the first thing I thought of was have a plan. Like that needs to be your first thing. Um, and make sure everyone that's uh, important in that plan knows the plan. Um, because nothing's great about getting caught off guard and who's going to speak and who's going to be in charge of talking to the media. Um, but also knowing what those those key messages are when you do have to speak in front of the media. So it's already, if it's a tornado, we know what we're gonna say, we know what's affected. We not, might not know all of the things we're gonna say yet, but what are we gonna do immediately after it happens? Do we all come together and figure it out? Like, just having that plan is probably the first, first thing I would say, and then. I'm gonna be a contrarian again. Yeah. And I'm gonna tell you protocol. Not a plan protocol. Not a plan. Plans are written down, yeah. and they're very hardwired. What she's talking And not everyone follows the plan. What lane do you have? What yeah. swim lane do you have? Who's got what information? Who do you go to to get that information? Who's going to be in front of this particular aspect of it? A protocol, because you cannot plan for every emergency. That's true. You cannot plan for every disaster. But a protocol will allow the right players to be in the right place. At the and right that, time. Okay. The other people who probably want to talk to the media understand why they shouldn't. It's not because we're hiding anything or we're lying to anyone, but because we need a unified voice in order to legitimately inform the public as to what's happening. Right. Um, so protocols allow that to happen. Who do I go to if I'm employee type A, employee type B, employee type C? The only real failure, two real failures in, in crisis management is A, not being prepared beforehand and B, not following those protocols that are set in place. That's the only way you can screw up crisis management. I said, at the end of the day- uh, Wrong message. Yeah, at the end of the day, you're controlling a message, but it, it's a logistic, real message. You can't lie about it, because the truth will come yeah. out. And if it is something like a tornado, natural disaster, crime, the government's involved, and you really don't want to get crossway with them, so you have to be honest. So on that same note, that was kind of a question I had, is uh, how is social media, uh, played an impact on how, how honest the company needs to be or an organization needs to be. And part B of that question is how has fake news screwed up the intentions yeah. of trying to We could have a whole we honest. could have a whole hour, hour on whole <laughs> beers yeah. and branding, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thirty seconds. What, what are your <laughs> yeah, what are your thirty seconds? The audience seconds wants the truth. You have, you can't you can't be I'll tell you, I'll start with it. First, fake news is also trying to yeah. first of all, you can't make yourself fake news by lying. Do I? You can't lie. And lying by omission is lying as well. So right. transparency is key, and that's a corporate culture that starts from way, way before a, a, an emergency happens. Before social media came around, right. you, could, you, could, you could. You could. You could cook the books a little bit. Right. Yeah. But you could quit answering the phone. And so. Any, if, if, you're, if you have a client or a boss who says, we don't have to worry about social media, 
Word. You you have to pound it into them that you do. I'm out. Because it is a reality now. Uh, so that's number one. And number two is it's better to be slow than wrong. Yeah. And the, the fake news and a lot of the you know the first 24 hours of news cycle, I don't pay attention to either because it's always wrong. That's all because everyone wants to be fast instead of right. Your, your job is to flip the script if you work for a company, an entity, or whatever, to not fall into the fast but wrong. My, my thinking on fake news, and this is just my opinion, is that it operates an awful lot like rumor does. Yeah. And rumor has a couple of things, two things, that are particularly important to killing that rumor. One is the interest that one has in the proposition if you don't care about Beyonce, you don't give a shit if she's got a crisis, right? The other is the ambiguity of information. So if there's, if there's truthful information available, people will understand that, right? So it's multiplicative if you can reduce the amount of interest in the proposition or you can reduce the ambiguity in the, in the situation, then you're effectively fighting off that rumor thing which I equate to kind of the fake news kind of thing. So, well, I, mean, I, I have no interest in any of the fake news, but I do have an interest in the truth. Yeah. People believe the fake news. Right. It's poisoning the water, and that that I do have a problem. We yeah. we just as professionals, as all of us as communication professionals, we have to actively say we're not going to pollute the water with that crap. Right. And even if we have to admit that our it's like never, I'm trying to tell them the truth, but they still want to believe. Right. Oh, and, and and they're going to believe the rumor if that's you can only do what, what you they can want do. to believe. Right. Yeah. So I, that's what I was wondering. Like, is yeah. There's no magic so bullet. I think it's a bigger problem than what we. Yeah. No single entity is going to fix it but you can not contribute to it. I was just at a conference during the hurricanes in Florida and all that, and I was sitting with Visit Savannah. They're good friends of mine, Savannah, Georgia. They were about to get hit by the hurricane. So they decided to go dark on social media. They had nothing to report, except they knew what the city was putting out, and if they were gonna say anything, it would be only what the government officials were saying about their city. So they directed everyone, they said, we're going to go dark. If you have any questions, you follow this account because we're not the people to tell you what's happening. So we're not going to be the we're not going to be the the voice behind what's happening with the hurricane, what the meteorologists are saying, any of that. So they did a really good thing by putting it out there that they're not going to be the ones to give you the information, whether it's fact or fiction. I mean, any of that. So I think it was very smart on their part of of, of opting out. People right. looking for the answers, right? I, it's a great case study. Look at how everything ha was handled during the most recent hurricanes, and in particular in Florida, the way that the, the government was allowing these pop-up sites, these pop-up social media channels to operate because they were providing accurate information. I mean, they're doing the job for you. So That's our time tonight. That went really fast once you started asking questions, yeah. right? It was better. <laughs> so, um, thank I, you, uh, thank you guys. I will be. I will hang around and answer any and all questions you have. I'm sure these guys will hang around and have another beer, maybe. Uh, we'll answer questions. We're gonna turn the cameras off, turn the microphones off, and we'll answer anything you want. We appreciate you guys coming uh, and engaging in a really great way. You guys ask really good questions, makes it easier for us, uh, and. We haven't planned 2018 yet, but if you bought tickets on Eventbrite, I now have your email, so I'll email you and let you know Data. what happens in right. 2018. <laughs> follow, follow us on Instagram and Twitter. It's Beers and Branding OKC on Instagram and BNB OKC on Twitter uh, or Google us. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Thanks you. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. Yes. Yes.